Hello everyone. Welcome to Intersect webinar series and uh, uh, thanks for joining. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the webinar titled Thinking Like a Computer, The Fundamentals of Programming. Uh, my name is Ghulam Murtza and I am Intersect eResearch Services Manager. And uh, this webinar will be presented by Majim Khan and Aidan Wilson. Uh, who are uh, the panelists right now with me. I would uh, request both of you to please quickly introduce yourselves and then we can go ahead and do the introductions. Awesome, thank you so much, Lam, and welcome to everybody who's attending. Um, like Lam said, my name is Mayim Khan. I am the e-research analyst for Intersect at the University of Adelaide. Um, and I, I have a technology background. I stumbled upon programming some 14, 15 years ago now, I think. Um, and I haven't looked back since. I did an undergrad in computer science and then a master's in educational technology and then have worked in a number of uh, technology roles since, uh, including as a programmer. So I am excited to be talking about the fundamentals of programming today. Uh, and I'm Aidan Wilson. I'm the um, Intersect A Research Analyst for ACU. Uh, based in North Sydney, um, and I do very much the same job as Mariam, but here at ACU, so supporting um, ACU's researchers in various technology, running training, and so forth. My background is uh, from quite a different um, space, so I'm a, I'm a linguist by training. Um, I did an undergrad at Sydney and a master's uh, of linguistics by research in uh, Melbourne, uh, and it was only since I completed all that that I turned my sights to programming because it was beneficial to me in, in various things that I was doing and I was just interested. So this webinar is pretty close close to my heart because it's just sort of emulates the thought process that I was going through as I was learning uh, how to program. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Mariam and Aidan. Um, I would like uh, to start the webinar by acknowledging uh, the traditional uh, custodians of country throughout Australia and their connection to land, sea, uh, and community, and they are Wurundjeri people for me, uh, Gadigal uh, people of the Eora Nation for Aden, and uh, Kona uh, people for Mariam. And we pay our respect uh, to their elders past, present, and extend that respect uh, to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, today. So Intersect Australia is a not-for-profit membership-based e-research um, uh, organization. We provide and we work end-to-end um, uh, uh, -end e-research uh, spectrum. Uh, we uh, do consulting, consultancy and advice to researchers at the university. And then at the back end, we work on software solutions and provide infrastructure around data storage and compute. And we'll talk a little bit more about it uh, in coming slides. It was formed uh, as a consortium of New South Wales universities in 2008. Uh, uh, however, since then we have uh, essentially uh, moved uh, out of New South Wales boundaries and uh, we uh, operate in uh, five states and territories uh, right now. And this is a list of uh, uh, our current members and you can see that we have uh, uh, universities, uh, not only from New South Wales universities, while mostly universities are from New South Wales, but there are universities from ACT, Victoria, and South Australia as well. And we also have some affiliate members uh, in form of government organization and some institutes as well. Everything Intersect does, everything we do at Intersect is uh, revolves around these uh, three key things where we help researchers move faster from hypothesis to a tested result using digital technologies. We help researchers uh, to uh, improve research collaboration and make their research diverse. And uh, uh, even uh, we, we consciously try to uh, forge uh, cross discipline uh, collaborations as well. And then we help researcher increase longevity of their research uh, by providing solution for preservation of their digital assets. We mainly work in four areas. Uh, we provide universities and their researcher advice on the use of technology in research. We provide research storage and compute infrastructure to universities as well. 
and we develop high quality software solution for research use cases uh, in partnership and collaboration uh, with the researchers. Last but not the least, we deliver a high quality training program at our member universities in research tools and technologies. And now uh, I'd like to talk a little bit more about our training program. Uh, our training program is delivered uh, both in person and online, uh, and it is uh, interactive hands-on uh, training program that is designed to improve research productivity and support world class research by imparting key e research skills and support to researchers. So since uh, uh, we uh, started in 2008, however, our training program really started in 2013. We have delivered more than 1500 courses and have trained more than 20,000 researcher, researchers across 15 member universities and research organizations. We crossed 20,000 mark very recently, actually. Uh, so we, have, we were quite happy about it. <laughs> um, our, our course catalog uh, covers the breadth of e-research tools. Uh, it's not just programming, but also data management uh, and collection tools like Qualtrics and Redcap. Uh, we also uh, provide courses in research computing and data analysis tools like Excel, SPSS, and Vivo, and we also uh, provide training in uh, high-performance computing uh, and cloud computing as well. We have recently uh, added uh, training courses in data science and machine learning areas as well, and we are trying to expand uh, uh, in that expand our offering in that area uh, in coming months. Uh, even more. Uh, this, uh, this webinar is part of our uh, newly uh, uh, started uh, fully open uh, research uh, technology webinar series, um, and it is suitable for SDR students, researchers, and professional staff. Um, and we started this program uh, in July last year. And some of the other webinars uh, are listed here, uh, which include uh, which included a uh, very popular webinar in uh, uh, form of uh, a showcase of data analysis uh, in Python and R, uh, and we use COVID-19 data as a case study. Uh, and then we had uh, a Redcap versus Qualtrics webinar, which was essentially a comparison between the two tools, and then uh, when uh, to use from, or when to move from PC to cloud or HPC environment. The recording of these webinars are available at uh, this link, uh, and please do get in touch if you uh, need to uh, you know, need to find out the link and uh, how to uh, get the recording of these webinars. So, uh, starting this webinar, we have also uh, we are also commencing a post webinar discussion uh, uh, session, uh, which would be a forty five minutes uh, session after this, right after this webinar. Uh, so it would run uh, in uh, pretty much peer support style uh, discussion format, uh, kind of hacky hour, if you may. I mean, we we didn't want to name it hacky hour. <laughs> Uh, we'll provide Zoom link uh, to uh, that particular meeting uh, so that it would be a separate meeting. So you would go out of this webinar uh, and would get into a separate meeting and we would provide the Zoom link for that meeting at the end of this webinar. That's it for me. I'll, I'll let uh, the experts now talk about uh, thinking, like, uh, thinking like a computer. Uh, and and how to go about fundamentals of programming. Awesome, thank you so much, Ram. Um, so yeah, so once again, welcome to everybody who's here. Um, the webinar for today, of course, is Thinking Like a Computer, The Fundamentals of Programming. So yeah, let's get stuck into this. Um, uh, so the, sorry, Aiden, can you go back for one slide? So the, uh, so the purpose of this webinar is to give you some insight into the ways that computers solve problems. Uh, there are several reasons you might want to do this, such as better understanding the fundamental aspects of programming languages. And of course, once you understand that, you can better learn those languages. 
Um, but other than that, another more basic reason is that learning this kind of analytical, logic-driven and, and process-oriented thinking is an excellent way of breaking down any problem into smaller pieces and approaching each piece in a methodical way. This is sometimes also called comp computational thinking. You may have heard that term. It's, it's, kind of, it's becoming quite popular uh, in recent years. Um, and and this, is a, this is a generic skill, which is useful for any kind of analysis and not just uh, programming. Okay, so this is our agenda for today. Uh, we will kick off with a couple of exercises to see the different ways that humans and computers solve problems. And hopefully during that process, you'll get an insight into the way a computer breaks down a problem, which will then help you in thinking like a computer uh, so you can more effectively write programs in the future. Uh, after those exercises, we look at the building blocks of a computer program, those being variables, conditionals, loops, and functions. Uh, and we'll explain each in terms of the thought processes you use to approach the earlier exercises. And then with those building blocks under your belt, we will take a look at a very basic program in R and in Python, and have a look at how those building blocks fit into the broader picture. And in the end, we'll discuss ways that you can write your programs, not just for computers to execute, but also for humans to understand, which is, of course, a, a very important aspect of uh, writing code. All right, on to our first exercise, uh, which is how a human solves a problem. So we are now going to put up on screen a bunch of numbers, and they will stay there for about four seconds. And what we want you to do is to identify the largest number. And while you're doing that, please pay special attention to the thought processes that you go through. And then after the exercise is over, we'll discuss some strategies, which we think how most people might have solved this problem. All right, the numbers will come up now. All right, uh, so you probably identified pretty easily that the largest number was 134, um, but the question is, what did you do to get there? If you're anything like us, you probably went through this process without, without even thinking about it. You would scan the whole space to assess the problem, make some initial determinations, such as that there were some negative numbers and some positive numbers, and that there were some single-digit numbers, double-digit and triple-digit numbers. Given these facts, you probably ignored everything with a minus sign immediately, and also only focused on the three digit numbers. Uh, and these two steps you might do interchangeably. They are both about discarding the information that you don't care about. This effective reducing of the, pro of the problem leaves you with a very simple calculation. Uh, which of the two remaining numbers, the three digit numbers, is the largest? And it was 134. This is a very human way to solve the problem. Humans are good at processing lots of pieces of information at the same time, uh, without you realizing it, and hon honing in on the few important pieces. In fact, the limit uh, for the number of pieces of information that you can retain at once is commonly referred to as seven plus or minus two. It could be as low as five for some people or as many as nine for some others, but it averages around seven. When presented with more things to think about, we reduce the problem to a size that fits into that seven plus or minus two. And an example of how, how you might do this is remembering your 10 digit phone number as three blocks of, uh, of three or four digit numbers. Right, so as Aiden said, humans are good at doing different things at the same time, in parallel, as it were. In contrast, computers are not so good at this, uh, generally speaking. Um, computers are instead very good at single calculations, and they can perform millions or billions of them every second, and that may give the illusion that they're doing multiple things at the same time, when in reality they're not. Um, I do realize that this is um, sort of oversimplifying things a little bit. There is a caveat to this, but we won't go into that for purposes of this webinar. Uh, so keeping this in mind, let's now turn our attention to the way a computer might solve a problem. So this is our second exercise. The task is the same. You have to find the largest number, but only this time around, we will present them in a slightly different way and it will take a bit longer. Um, but as before, please pay attention to the thought processes that go into solving this problem. And again, afterwards, we will discuss. So 
So how did you solve the problem this time around? Again, if you're anything like us, you did something like this. Patiently wait for a new number to pop up. And when it does, uh, if it is larger than the previous number, remember it and discard the previous number. If it is not larger, then disregard it and repeat until there are no, no, no more numbers shown. At the end of all the numbers, the number you are currently remembering must deductively be the largest, and it was 170. By showing you the numbers one at a time, you're forced to process them one at a time. And that's quite close to how computers think, serially, processing one piece of information in a single calculation, and then moving on to the next calculation, discarding information when it's not relevant or no longer needed. Here's an animation, uh, sorry for our animation skills, um, to explain that graphically. So we start with a space in our brain where we're going to store the only number that we care about, which we're calling largest so far. Um, we're presented with our first number, 37, and uh, we've got nothing stored yet in largest so far, so we store 37 as the largest number. The next number, 122, is larger, so we keep it, uh, discarding the previous number uh, that we were remembering. And we repeat this process, discarding numbers or replacing the number we were uh, discarding uh, or replacing the number we're thinking about until we run out of numbers. And when we do run out, the one that we're holding on to must have been the largest. Just to illustrate an important point on the discarding of irrelevant information, you will have easily figured out that 170 was the largest number, but do you remember what the second largest number was? This is a little bit unfair because you weren't asked to look for it, but that's kind of the point. You discarded the information that was not relevant to the task at hand. You probably have a pretty good idea that 122 was one of the other high numbers. And in fact, it was the third highest number. Uh, if your memory is really good, you probably remember that there was another number somewhere in the 130s that was the second highest number, but you might not remember exactly that, what it was. In fact, it was 131. 122 was probably memorable for you because uh, for a little while at least, it was the largest so far, so you were keeping it in memory. But by the time 131 was shown, it wasn't higher than the highest so far at that point, as 170 had already been revealed. So you would have dis disregarded 131 immediately when it was shown. Let's reformulate this information to something a little closer to how a computer might describe these steps. So for each number, we will perform a calculation. If it is higher than the number we've seen, uh, then we will keep it. If not, um, then we move on and we repeat all of that until we have no more numbers left. After all the numbers have been shown, the number we're keeping is the largest. This, uh, what we've written up here is called pseudocode. It's not exactly written in the format a computer can understand, but it's very close and can be converted line for line to pretty much any real programming language that the computer can, can then run as a program. And we'll see some examples of this later in this webinar. All right, so now at this point, we hopefully have some understanding of the serial kind of step-by-step -step nature of a computer program. Um, and we have also, of course, developed a small pseudocode for solving a problem as a computer would. Uh, so now let's take a look at the fundamental concepts and building blocks that we used in this process and in the pseudocode, and we will attach terms to these concepts as we get a better understanding of what they are. So the first concept we'll talk about is variables. So from our little exercise earlier, we can see that the first thing we need is that space in memory to hold uh, the largest number we have encountered so far. So in our animation, it was that little box in, inside our brain. Um, in, our, in our pseudocode, we call this space largest, and the pseudocode is, is at the top of the screen. Um, and, and so that is exactly what a variable is. It's a place in your computer's memory that can store some values. That, uh, that place in memory has to have a name or a label so that you can refer to that memory and whatever is stored in it later on in your program. And as the name suggests, of course, the value stored in a variable can change or can vary as your program runs. So for example, at the start of our earlier exercise, the value stored in the variable largest was 37, but then it kept changing every time a larger number pops up. Uh, so each variable also has to have a type or, or a data type. Um, some common data types are integers, which are whole numbers, which can be positive or negative. 
Uh, there's decimal numbers, which are also called floating point numbers or simply floats, and they can also be positive or negative. Uh, we could have strings or characters, which is just text data. Uh, and we can also have Boolean or logical values, which are true or false and hold one of those two values. Um, and then you can also, of course, combine these to get, let's say, lists of numbers or tables or matrices or, or more complex um, things like that. So why are data types important? Uh, knowing the type for each variable is useful for many reasons, in particular because it helps the program know what it can or what it should do with that variable. So going back to the exercise earlier, you may have noticed that as numbers were popping up on the screen, uh, there was also at one point a suit of club symbol, which probably made you think, that's not a number, what am I supposed to do with this? So as an example, if your um, so if your largest what yeah so if your largest was uh, let's say one to twenty two at a particular point, and the next number is seventy eight seventy eight is is obviously smaller than one twenty two you would have discarded it um, minus nine is also smaller you would have discarded that but with the club symbol you can't do that comparison of which one is greater it just doesn't make sense because it's a completely different data type. You know, as another example, integers and decimals allow operations like addition and subtraction, multiplication and division. And you can also, of course, do comparisons like greater than or equal to. But however, all of these may not always apply to, let's say, strings or text variables. I mean, for example, multiplying or dividing two strings doesn't make sense. It doesn't, yeah, it's, it doesn't evaluate to anything that makes sense to us. So therefore, it's important to keep the data type of your variable in mind. Um, and you can, in all program languages, you can also check the data type of a particular variable in your program to make sure it is uh, what you expect it to be. All right, so that was a quick introduction to, va to variables. Um, the second fundamental concept we will cover today is conditionals. This is how computers make decisions. So for example, in the pseudocode at the top, the second line, starting with if, uh, compares the values of the two numbers and then does something different based on whether or not the new number was larger. This is an example of a conditional or an if statement, uh, and it's also sometimes called branching, branching logic. Um, but conditionals basically change the flow of the, program of the program based on whether or not a certain condition is met. So while a standard piece of code would run one line after another in sequence, a conditional asks a question and then based on the response to that question, it will execute a different uh, branch or a different block of code. And once it's done, it will go ahead and continue running the rest of your program normally. So what kinds of conditions can we check for? Um, it, yeah, uh, Pretty much uh, anything that can be said to be true or false. Uh, some examples are is this number greater than this number? Or does this string exactly equal this other string? Or you can even have more complex expressions like and that are joined with and or or, such as is this number greater than that number and also less than some other third number. The typical structure of a conditional is, it looks something like this. So you say, if something is true, then do this. And then optionally, you can also add more conditions with else if. So you say else if something else is true, then do that, uh, and so on and so forth. And then in the end, you can say else do another thing if none of the earlier conditions are true. This last else branch is kind of a catch all. So you might remember in our, in our finding largest ex number example, we effectively uh, only had two branches. So if the number is larger, you store it, and then it was kind of implied that else or if the number is smaller, you just discard it. Um, but you can have more than two branches. You can have as many branches as you need. The important thing to remember is that no matter how many branches you have, uh, only one branch will be executed for each conditional block every time the program runs. So here's another example that has lots of conditions and branches. Uh, so this is some Python code, some hypothetical Python code for assigning a letter grade based on a numeric score out of 100. So let's say we have a student with a score of 75 
Uh, if we run this program, the program would check the condition for the first branch. Uh, so the condition is false, um, 75 is not greater than 90, so the program skips that branch. Instead, it goes to check the next condition. Uh, and so over here, it says LIF. LIF stands for else if in Python. So it checks is score greater than 80. Again, uh, this is false, so it skips the grade B branch as well. It will then check the third condition, which is true, 75 is greater than 70. Uh, so it will execute this branch and print grade C. But from then onwards, it will ignore the rest of the conditional, uh, which over here is the parts for grade D and F. Notice that technically, if it had checked those conditions, if it had checked if score is greater than 60, that would have been true. But since it has already executed a, a higher branch in this conditional block, um, the program will just ignore all of these remaining branches. So conditionals are one way that the flow of a computer program can change. Another way is through what are called loops. Um, the fact is that humans don't like performing repetitive tasks. They're mundane, boring, we end up losing interest and making mistakes. Computers, in contrast, are very good at them. And the way you can tell a computer to do a task repetitively is by using loops, or one way at least. If you think back to our earlier example, uh, exercise of finding the largest number, you are repetitively checking every new number and comparing it with the largest number encountered so far and deciding whether or not you, whether you want to keep it or discard it. One way that uh, to do that would be to basically copy and paste that conditional block again and again and again. If you had 10 numbers, you'd have to copy it, you know, nine times to make 10 blocks. That makes your code cumbersome, difficult to read, and then if you want to repeat that exercise with, say, a set of 11 numbers, your code wouldn't work properly. So instead, we use a loop in our pseudocode, which is the first line here, for each number, basically meaning keep repeating the next lines for each new number that we, uh, that we encounter, as long as there are new numbers coming up. In effect, a loop repeats one set of instructions over a set of inputs, in our case, numbers. Loops, uh, uh, loops are a very powerful functionality of programming languages. For example, if you define the steps needed to process one row of data in your table or uh, one file in a, in a folder, um, then you can lose, use a loop in your program to apply those steps to all other rows in your data or all other files in your folder. And you can do that uh, by adding one or two lines of code. So once again, if we look at a visual representation of this, a standard computer program would run these lines one at a time. But, if you, but when you have a loop, the computer will first check your condition for the loop. For example, if you are looping over all items in a list, it will see if there is another item in the list uh, to, to run the code over. And if there is, it will execute the lines of code and inside the loop using, using that particular item. Uh, at the end, it will go back to the top to see if there is another item. And if there is, it will repeat. If there isn't, uh, it will come out of the loop and go on executing the rest of the program. By way of terminology, individual instances of the code that runs inside a loop is called an iteration. And the, uh, the list of items over which the code runs, in our case, the list of numbers, are often called iterables, the things that may be iterated over. Let's drill down and see iterations in a bit more detail. We have a reduced set of numbers here uh, in our input, just by way of example. Uh, the four items in our input, four iterables, means that our loop will have four iterations. In the first iteration, we don't have any value for the highest number so far, and so our current number, the first value in the list, is 37. We decide if it is bigger than what we have stored as the largest so far, which doesn't exist, so yes, 37 is now the largest. In iteration two, 37 is the largest so far, and our current iterable is negative 58. Is that larger than 37? No, so our largest remains unchanged. In iteration three, 37 is still our largest number, uh, and our new number to compare it to is 122, which is larger, so 122 is now the largest. Finally, in the last iteration, 122 is our current largest number, and our new number to, to compare is 170, which is larger, and so it is our new largest number. At the end of of the loop, all we need to do is recall the current value of the largest number variable, which is 170. The final concept that we'll describe today is functions. 
so here at the top, I uh, once again have the same pseudocode that we've been using as an example so far, but with one slight change. I have given our little program or our set of instructions a title or a label, find largest number. That at a very basic level is what a function is. It groups together a set of instructions that do a certain task and gives these instructions a name. That function can then be run again just by invoking its name rather than copying and pasting the code. Uh, a function uh, uh, can take different inputs and they can yield different outputs. Functions are often described as recipes or using the analogy of a recipe. So imagine you need to bake a cake, but you didn't have the recipe. You might go through some initial trial and error, trying out different ratios of ingredients, cooking times and temperatures before you finally landed on an edible cake. Once you do that though, you would write down the steps so you can repeat it easily in future and not have to go through all that trial and error again. I don't do this, I never write down recipes and everything is, is, a, is a disaster. Uh, moreover, other people might have done this trial and error for you and published their recipes. Functions are very much like this. You can define them yourself or you can use functions that other people have defined. And most programming languages, well, programming languages have lots of functions built into them. Uh, again, to illustrate this, Imagine that a function is I'm switching analogies now, but imagine it's like a black box uh, and we feed in a bunch of input numbers and it will return an output. Our first list outputs a value of 170. And uh, again, we can run this again, we can run this again very quickly without having to modify our code just by passing in a different set of input parameters and it will similarly return an output. In this second case, note that we have less input numbers, but our function still runs perfectly smoothly and returns us the highest number still, which in this case is 88. Great, so those were the four fundamental concepts in programming we wanted to talk about. Uh, once again, so that's variables, conditionals, loops, and functions. We have so far introduced what they are in a somewhat abstract way with the pseudocode. Um, let's now put all of them together and see what the actual final code would look like that a computer would be able to run. So here is what that pseudocode would translate to in Python. And so I'd like to spend a couple of minutes here and just go through this line by line with you. So we start in this code, we start with the, on the first line, defining the function that actually does the work. Uh, in Python, you define a function with a keyword def, followed by the function name, uh, which in this case is find underscore largest. Um, and then in parentheses, you specify what the input of that function will be. Um, and in our case, it'll be a list of numbers, which we're just calling numbers. And then there's a colon at the end of the line. So all the lines after this colon that are indented uh, are the instructions that are inside this function. So uh, the first thing we do inside the function on line two is that we create that variable, which was again, that space in memory to hold the largest number. Um, and it's assigned, it has no value assigned to it at the start. The next line has the loop, which will iterate over each number in the list of numbers um, that was inputted to the function. So we say for number in numbers. Uh, line four is the conditional that will compare the current number uh, with the largest number so far, and then decide to replace the value in the variable largest or not. And finally, the last line of function outputs the largest number with the keyword return. So at this point, we have only defined this function. We haven't actually told the computer to execute this code or even given it a list of numbers to use. Um, so if we go back to Aiden's earlier analogy, this is kind of like writing down a recipe, but not actually making it. When we do want to use this function to find the largest number in a particular list, we first have to define that list of numbers. So we've done that in line eight, and we put that list of numbers in a variable called my underscore list. And then finally in line 10, that is where we tell the computer to actually run this function. This is where our find underscore largest function is called. Um, and it is given the list of numbers we have stored in my underscore list as the input. So now we're going to show these four concepts uh, juxtaposed in R and Python. So you can see how fundamentally similar they are. Uh, and that if you learn how to code in one language, that that knowledge will transfer to other languages. 
Um, there's some there's some caveats that aren't important. We're not going to go into a lot. We're not going to drill down to a lot of detail. The importance here is to note that um, you know once you know what things are doing, it's quite easy to read, and that multiple languages are actually very similar to one another. So we have the code here in both languages side by side, but R on the left and Python on the right. And immediately you can see that they're broadly similar, uh, but there are some minor differences in how a particular instruction is written in each language. Uh, so first we'll look at the differences in variable assignment. So for example, in R, uh, uh, we use this uh, a digraph, which is, um, uh, which is actually a less than and a dash, but in this font, it's converted into a ligature, which looks like a left arrow, but it should actually be written like this in your code. Uh, sorry for that complexity. Um, this is how we assign variables. So uh, here, the, the, the label of the variable largest um, is, is given the value NA, which means not applicable in, in R, the same as none in Python. Uh, Python is actually similar to most languages where they just use the equal sign as the, um, as the variable assignment uh, uh, symbol. Uh, for compatibility, equal sign is also acceptable in R, but the less than dash um, digraph is not acceptable in Python. Similarly, conditionals. Uh, uh, R, uh, uh, so if we look at this, here, here, is, here is where the conditionals are. Um, and they are similar to each other just with the same kinds of differences. So in R, the, the if statement, um, the, the arguments within the if statement, so the things that are compared, number is greater than largest, are wrapped in parentheses, and then the whole block of code that constitutes the, um, the code that's run if that is evaluated as true, are wrapped in uh, curly braces. In Python, uh, we don't need the parentheses, and we have a colon at the end of that first line. And then the whole, uh, uh, just Python basically uses indentation to indicate these things. Everything that is indented to the same level underneath that is, is uh, interpreted as being part of the code that should run if this evaluation is true. Here are the loops in both languages. Uh, they're again very similar and very similar to conditionals. So again, R has parentheses around the, the, this first line of the, um, of the loop that determines the input parameters where Python does not have these and Python has a colon uh, and indentation underneath to determine what is the code block that runs as part of the loop, where again, R has these curly braces. So the opening one here and the closing one here. And the first lines have the function headers, which are a little bit different in each language. So in R, we, we give the, the function name first, and then we use the variable assignment um, symbol and feed in the, this function keyword, and then we have the input parameters there. And again, the whole function itself is wrapped in curly braces. Whereas in Python, it looks very similar to all the other things in Python. We have the def keyword, which means define, the label for the function, so our function name, find largest, and input parameters in um, parentheses, followed by a colon, and then indentation for each line after that that is part of that function. Again, don't worry about the details too much. Um, this, this kind of thing you would learn from an introdu introductory course in, either of the, in, in any of these languages. Uh, so you're not, you know, we don't expect you to learn how to code. We expect you to, to, to be able to look at someone else's code and understand what it's trying to do. Okay, so hopefully you can get a sense of how these two languages are really very similar. And in fact, most languages at these very basic levels are much the same as one another, including MATLAB, Julia, Java, C++, etc. It's only when you come to more complex applications of these languages that they begin to diverge, which is beyond the scope of today. Okay, so while it's true that when we write a program, we write it so they can be executed by a computer, we must remember that this program will also be read by humans, including collaborators, other researchers might be uh, included as part of a publication, and also, probably most importantly, it might be read by yourself in future. So there's a number of good habits or conventions that one should follow to make the program easily readable for humans as well. 
Uh, so there are some naming conventions. Variables should be named in a mnemonic way so that you can understand what the program is doing just by reading it. A computer will execute the code fine no matter what. The names of variables and functions is arbitrary as far as a computer is concerned. As long as, in, it, as long as it is syntactic, it will execute. However, humans will be reading this too and they need to be able to understand things. This is important when you yourself might need to revisit your code in future and you can't remember what you meant originally. It's also important if you share your code with others, which uh, you will find yourself doing eventually. Besides being mnemonic, there are conventions around the format of a label, like uh, a variable or a function name. We cannot use spaces in these labels in programming languages because a space is interpreted in a special way. So if you have a multi-word phrase that you'd like to be a label, then we've got to separate each of those words uh, with a different character or get rid of the space. So there are um, uh, a few different conventions on this. We've got two of these here. Um, the first is called camel case, where, uh, where each word, or not, not the first word, but each subsequent word is capitalized. So it looks kind of like a hump, um, hence camel. And the other is called snake case, where everything is lowercase and you replace the space with an underscore. So the whole thing is small and long and it looks like a snake is kind of the, the analogy there. Another convention is to include the units on uh, variable names for values that have units or for which units are, are important. If you use snake case, you would include these at the end, just like this, weight underscore kg or temp underscore c um, uh, for uh, weight in kilograms or temperature in Celsius. Importantly, once you've picked a convention, you should stick to it. Your convention should be your convention could be different to these, but whatever it is, you should be consistent. Another thing to note here is that programming languages almost entirely are case sensitive, uh, so beware of that. Let's look at this with an example. So we have a, what we have here is a function that is written perfectly well from the perspective of a computer. It is syntactic, it has no errors. It'll generate some output when run on some input. Um, it's a different example from one we had earlier. Um, so that you can't guess what it is. But from the perspective of a human, it's not particularly well written. We could work through it and figure it out mathematically, um, but it's still not clear to us what the purpose of this function is. Let's rewrite this using our conventions of mnemonic variables and function names and consistency and see if it makes sense. So this is, this is uh, hopefully you can see just by looking at it and without having to run it, that this is a simple program to find out the total internal angles of a polygon of some number of sides, i.e. a square has 360 degrees, a triangle has 180 and so forth. These two programs are functionally and syntactically equivalent and the computer treats them equally, but the latter is absolutely easier for a human to understand. A couple of things to note here. We have a variable called temp, uh, which is a convention that typically means temporary. In this case, it's an arithmetic step, um, arithmetic step, sorry, between the input and the output, uh, and so it makes sense to call it temp for temporary. This is very common, but beware that if you're working with temperature data, temp might also be used as the natural abbreviation for that, so just something to be aware of. Secondly, you'll notice that we use both, um, both camel case and snake case in this example, and you might think that's being a little bit inconsistent. Uh, on the contrary, your convention might be to use camel case for uh, for function labels and snake case for variables. So, um, uh, so uh, that's very common. Is you know, the programmers will programmers in a particular language will use a particular convention for for these types of variables or those types of variables. So it helps to look up those conventions if you if you can. Right, so, so naming conventions and, and mnemonic variables and so on, that's one way to make your code um, readable for humans. The other major way that you can do that is to make judicious use of comments. Uh, comments are pieces of text in your program that are not executed by the computer. Uh, they are deliberately ignored. Um, and comments in code are used for many reasons, including testing and planning, which we won't get into right now but they are very importantly used also for documenting. Comments basically allow you to include human readable text that explains what a chunk of code might do. So that way, if someone is rereading your program to modify it for a different purpose, for example, 
the comments you have put in will greatly help them in understanding um, what a program is doing. But critically, comments are useful for yourself as well as just as much as anyone else reading your code. And since you may forget things quickly, it's a very good idea to comment early, comment often, and don't leave this kind of documentation until the end, uh, by which time you might already have forgotten what your program does. Um, you will be surprised at how quickly you forget. You think you'll remember why you used something, but you will very quickly forget. So, so when you're writing in your comments, think about what your future self might need to, to know about it as well. Um, there are several ways for marking comments depending on the language. So in both R and Python, uh, anything that comes after a hash on any line is ignored. Uh, this could go on like a hash on its own line, uh, or it can come after a certain piece of code. Um, there's lots of other conventions, but this is language specific, so you should find out first. Um, and reading someone else's code uh, is a good way to see these sorts of conventions again, like, like Aiden said. Um, there could also be common blocks which span multiple lines, but again, we won't sort of talk about that here. So to illustrate this further, here's our internal angles example once again. Um, but this time it's a little bit more complicated uh, since we've added a conditional uh, that checks to make sure that the user has entered at least three as a number of sides and it stops if they haven't because this function doesn't make sense for, for a shape with less than three sides. Um, so this extra piece tells the program to stop and warn the user that the number they entered is invalid. But the, the important point that we want to emphasize here is the comments, which are gray in this color scheme. So you can see there is a comment right at the top of this function that explains in plain English what the function is intended to do. It's intended to calculate the internal angles of a polygon of a given number of sides. There is also a comment here in this conditional block that explains that three is the minimum number of sides of a polygon possible. And finally, there is a comment at the end of this line that explains what this line does. It forces the program to stop processing. Uh, once again, just note that it is anything after the hash sign that is interpreted as a comment. So all of the code on this line um, that is before the hash will still execute just fine. Great, okay, so that brings us towards the end of uh, what we want to cover in this webinar. Hopefully that would have given you some idea of the kind of paradigm shift between how we as humans think uh, versus how computers think, and also would have introduced some of the key tools and concepts you have at your disposal to write computer programs to solve your, your particular problem. So where do you go from here? Uh, the next step we would suggest is to keep an eye out for introductory courses in programming language in your programming language of choice. Um, most universities do have training options for these. Uh, of course, if you're from one of intersex members, you can access our training courses at your campus or online. Um, you can take a look at our website to see what courses are happening at your uni, or you can find your local ERA to ask them uh, whether there's any, any coming up. Also, um, there are several free online platforms that you can you know, start coding in right away, depending on which language you want to pursue. So there's some examples here. There's Google's Colab for Python. There's RStudio Cloud and MATLAB Online for each of those languages. Uh, and then if you have access to Cloud Store, um, probably through your institution, you can also use Swan for Python, R, and Octave. The cloud store, if you're not familiar with it, it's provided by Rnet and pretty much every Australian um, university would have access to it. So you'd have a small amount of storage as well as some uh, compute capability in those languages. And lastly, you can also look at other webinars in this Intersect webinar series and you can find recordings of previous webinars on our website. Um, I'll also pop the link in the chat uh, in a second. Um, but in particular, I do want to highlight this particular webinar, uh, which is Start Coding Without Hesitation, Programming Languages Showdown. We are delivering this live once again um, on May 5th, uh, and Aiden will be one of the panelists for that once again. Um, so this webinar is sort of the natural next step from today's webinar, because in that we will be introducing the four popular programming languages in research. So that's Python, R, MATLAB, and Julia. And we'll compare them across uh, different characteristics and metrics. And that screenshot is, is a bit of a spoiler, but yeah, definitely worth um, listening to the whole discussion to help you decide which one would best suit you and your research. 
All right, I think that's everything from us. Um, please feel free to pop your questions in the chat. And if you want to reach out to us, or, uh, you can email us at this address or check out our website. I will hand back to Wulang now to uh, moderate the Q&A. Excellent. Uh, very fascinating uh, webinar. Uh, uh, last time I could not uh, attend uh, all of it, so so it was it was pretty new to me as well. So thank you, thank you guys, um, and and thanks for everyone who asked questions. Uh, and uh, there were a few questions that I just realized that I was answering them, and I did not share the answers to everyone. So uh, sorry about that. But uh, thank you so much for asking questions. Uh, there was one question which uh, I think I'll like to get uh, your uh, opinion as well. And that is a question by uh, Louise. Uh, I tried to answer it, but that was about uh, why the variable or variable for list is called numbers in the function. And then what is the difference uh, when you say number in numbers and why was it called numbers when you provided it as my list to start with? So just like, you know, if you could highlight a little bit of difference between my list numbers and then number. So well, maybe I'll take a, a stab at that. So basically, uh, that's a very good question. That's a very good observation, firstly, I should say. Um, so what's happening here is that, uh, yeah, if you can go back, if you can maybe go back to the, the original Python code, that might help. Yeah, because that has the mileage example. All right. So, oh, so how should I explain this? So what's happening is that my list is a is the variable of the list of numbers that you want to pass in a particular instance when you're you know running that code for that particular that particular time. Whereas when you define a function, you kind of generically name that input as numbers. So irrespective of whatever you pass into that function later on, you could have called it my list, you could have called it, you know, ABCD, you could have called it foobar, whatever. As within the function, it will just, um, it will be referred to as numbers. Uh, so that's kind of like an abstraction, I guess you could call it. Um, I don't know if Aiden or Gulam, you want to explain it in another way. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's, Sorry. Yeah. No, you go ahead. You go ahead. Yeah. So I think I think that's perfect. I mean, uh, just using the analogy of black box. So function is a black box. So within that black box, any input you would provide, uh, any input list you would provide would be called numbers. Outside of that black black box, that input which you are going to provide or that list which you are going to provide can be called anything. So that input was my list, but when it went in the black box that black box refers it as numbers, yeah, but it would still be the same list. And then the third line, which is for number in numbers. So the number is a variable that refers to the individual elements of that list. So it would start in the first iteration, it would start with the value 37. And then in the second iteration, it would have the value 122, so on and so forth. So uh, and, and that is called loop variable. So that is defined essentially in line number three. Yeah, and it's important to notice, Mariam said that the that the names for these are completely arbitrary. So there's nothing that Python is doing to understand that these are numbers. As far as Python is concerned, these are just items in a list. And the way that it divides up a list, which we're calling numbers within the scope of the function, is um, each is, is divided by item. So um, it, uh, if you did something like you gave it a list of uh, strings or something, then, uh, then this kind of line would fail and it would just return and say, sorry, I don't know how to understand this, um, this thing because it's not, it's, not, it's not knowing that these are numbers. This is written for our benefit to understand what this, what this uh, program is doing. Uh, but yeah, the, the difference between this and this, we deliberately made this different because... Um, uh, yeah, as Gulam said, like there's the, the, typically one doesn't know what's happening inside the function. Um, it's not available to you. And, and in fact, there's a strong division within Python that stuff, stuff that happens within the scope of the function um, uh, from things that are happening outside. So, so really Python actually treats functions as a black box. So when you feed in a, 
an input list of numbers into a function, what Python is internally doing is making a, a little copy of that list um, for itself, which it stores as the value numbers. Um, so it doesn't do any operating on your actual, um, on your actual list of numbers. Um, uh, I'm not sure if that makes sense, but, um, uh, but yeah, but the, I think the essential point is we don't typically know what's going on in functions. We're doing this one because we wrote it, but if we're using someone else's uh, code or their own functions, we, we don't know what's going on inside and we can just give Python some other, some other list or some other variable. Okay. So, uh, we have a couple more questions, but before we go on to them or those questions, I, uh, thanks Aiden and Mariam for putting it in the chat as well, uh, that we'll have a post webinar discussion session, which would be 45 minutes, uh, kind of, you know, discussion session where we can have, uh, ask questions, have discussion in general, like, you know, age old questions you might have uh, in your head about programming. We can, we can discuss that as well. But uh, Aiden and Marjim, uh, I'll actually ask you guys. So there are a couple of questions. Would you want to address them here or uh, here? Yeah, okay. So uh, well, the first one I will certainly. Um, there's a okay. question which is um, uh, from an anonymous attendee. I've been told certain languages are better for certain disciplines. For example, R versus Python in health sciences. Um, yes, uh, absolutely true. The easiest way to give you the answer is come to our next webinar, which goes into this in quite a lot of detail. Um, uh, you, you're right, R is more typically used in things like health sciences versus Python, but they all pretty much do the same thing anyway. And that, and that webinar will give you some strategies on how to decide. The most important strategy is what are your peers using? Uh, because you're likely going to be utilizing your peers for support and training and accessing code. So if they're using R, you should just tap into that and use R. I hope that answers the question. Do you guys have any other input on that? I think that was absolutely a fantastic answer, Aiden. Uh, right. I, have, I have nothing more to add. Uh, Mayim? No, I agree. Yeah, okay. So then uh, there's another question uh, from Katrina. Uh, she says, I always struggle uh, uh, with seeing the merit of while loop. What does it add uh, that cannot be achieved with for? and if in combination. This is a good one. We haven't talked about while loops, but, um, uh, and when I was learning programming, I, I and in fact, me and Myron were discussing this just this week as we were finalizing um, this, this webinar, because while loops kind of are like a for loop with a, um, they're, they're a loop with a built-in if. Um, so you can have while current number is less than 10, do a bunch of stuff, and then also add one to the current number. So that might limit that loop running to 10 times. That's sort of the way people use while loops or one of the ways people use, use while loops. Another way that people use while loops is saying something like while true. So it'll always run. Um, and then inside the, the while loop, you would explicitly end it by saying something like break or return, or I'm not sure what the keyword is. It depends on the language. Um, and uh, you can often, uh, catch yourself out by having something, a loop running infinitely or indefinitely, and you, you might crash your browser or your program or, you know, crash your, your R interpreter. Um, uh, if you, if you, if you just say while true and don't, don't end the loop somehow, but effectively, yeah, a while loop is, uh, to be read like, like a for loop, except that instead of iterating over items in a list, you, the, the program will continue to the top and rerun the loop if the condition is still true. That's, that's what, what that effectively means. Yeah. Uh, but you're right, you can, you can combine while and uh, a for and an if to get the functionality of a while loop. So I guess while is just a bit more um, of a shorthand. I guess in some very advanced applications, one might be more optimal to use than the other, but really for a vast majority of cases you can do you know, they, you can implement the same thing with both. It, it depends on your preference and also depends on the language. Mm. And Katrina, if you come to the open discussion after this, we can, we can um, discuss this more, um, might hear what, exactly what you're doing and see if we can explain it in a way that is 
beneficial to you. Um, and maybe given that it's just gone, well, it's 103, so we might sh shut this webinar and move over there now. Uh, yeah. Again, the link is in the chat. Um, so please do click on that if you want to join us. You know, you can, you can talk if you want to there and, and discuss things. Um, and yeah. yeah. And so thank you for coming and we'll see you there.